Olá, bem-vindos a mais uma conversa com Gegrade. Hoje, Gegrade conversa com Branco Kolarevich. Uh, é a nossa primeira uh, conversa em inglês aqui da, da série. Welcome, everyone, to um, our series of talks with uh, Gegrade. Uh, today, uh, we will be talking, uh, well, he will be talking, <laughs> Branko Kolarevich. Um, Para o pessoal ouvindo que não entende muito inglês, uh, a palestra hoje é em inglês, uh, mas a, a gente, quem quiser postar perguntas, Uh, no chat em português, a gente traduz, né? Você está entendendo a palestra, mas não quer escrever em inglês, a gente vai uh, traduzindo. Pode ir postando perguntas, mas nós vamos reservar para falar no... para fazer todas no final. Um, pode ir postando perguntas, mas nós vamos reservar para... I had the, the thing open somewhere else. Um, so, back to English now. Um, today, like I said, we will be talking uh, with uh, Branco. Uh, welcome, Branco. Thank, Thank you, you very much for uh, being here with us today. Um, Branco is the uh, Dean of the Hillier College of Architecture and Design. Um, at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, he has uh, taught uh, in several uh, institutions um, worldwide about uh, the use of digital technologies in design and production, and um, has written uh, several books uh, about this um, topic, in, in, including uh, the one Mass Customization and Design uh, democratization, which I'm sure we will hear more about um, today. Uh, so I'm going to uh, let you talk now. <laughs> Welcome. Muito obrigado, Luisa. So um, I have to 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 say that uh, I wish uh, um, I am in Brazil. I had the uh, uh, the privilege of you know visiting your beautiful country nine times so far so i have been to various parts of uh, brazil uh, of course rio de janeiro sao paulo but been to florianopolis and some other places smaller places hopefully would, pelotas next <laughs> pelotas next uh, and i would like to see the north of the country and, and so on i mean it's I'm, I'm familiar with brazil and brazilian culture and i have to say that there is a bit of brazil close to where i am um, i am in new york uh, which is part of the kind of New York metropolitan area. And then in Newark itself, we have an area called Iron Bound, uh, where Brazilian and Portuguese Americans live. So I have good access to caipirinhas and all kind of good things that, that, uh, that come from, uh, from, uh, from Brazil. So, oh, that's and I, great. Yeah, and I drive, I drive to, the, uh, to the area, so you, know, you can Google Ironbound, New York, and, and you can you know, discover um, this, this kind of oasis of, of Brazil that we have, again, in the city where our university, university is. So, once again, uh, Luisa, thank you for the uh, uh, opportunity. It is a real privilege to talk to um, all of you uh, uh, tonight. Luisa and I had a chance to uh, work together for a number of years at the University of Calgary, where she was doing her doctoral studies and I had the pleasure of being her her uh, supervisor so she's now back in Brazil and I moved to 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 New York but um, again it was a, it was a pleasure to uh, to to work uh, to work together I think at this point we can uh, switch to my presentation I believe that's now being shared with with everyone so uh, you have heard uh, from Luisa that the topic uh, of my talk tonight as mass customization and design democratization. Uh, it is based on a book um, that was um, published uh, two years ago. And the book itself uh, was born out of a symposium that was organized in 2017 in Philadelphia 
with Jose Duarte, uh, who is a very good friend of mine. Uh, he's Portuguese. Uh, and uh, the two of us uh, have been involved uh, in the world of parametric design and uh, digital fabrication uh, for, uh, for years. So I, um, like Jose, uh, was at that time um, interested uh, in the world of non-standard production, meaning that we had a promise of uh, people being able to customize uh, the geometry of the things around them. So our students were able to change the sizes of spaces. They were um, able to affect the geometry. The kind of unique geometry that got created could be easily fabricated using digital fabrication. And at that time, we thought about the social and cultural implications of these technological advances. And we thought that uh, these technological changes would enable almost everyone to have access to good design that would be available through websites and that people will be able to uh, download designs, change them or change designs on the screen and have them manufactured in a way that would fit their unique, uh, unique needs. This kind of world of good design being accessible to everyone where designs you know, could be customized uh, didn't happen. So Jose and I were interested in kind of understanding what are the causes that this kind of large cultural change in how design is produced and then consumed by people, we wanted to understand why this change didn't unfold as, as expected. So my lecture this evening is going to be a little bit about what mass customization is, what it was imagined to be. I'll show you examples from various domains, you know, how mass customization is implemented today. And then I'll kind of share with you uh, some um, kind of conclusions that Jose and I uh, came um, came about in our um, exploration of this uh, of this topic. Um, Joseph Pine uh, was wrote an influential book titled "Mass Customization" in 1993. He comes from the world of business. Uh, and he was one of the speakers at the symposium that we organized. And he defined mass customization very succinctly as a strategy to exploit the need to support greater product variety and individualization. That's in essence what mass customization is about. And what it implies is that there is suddenly then this shift from a mere customer to someone who designs the product that they want to want to have. And that's a kind of significant shift. And Joseph was projecting this as the kind of future of the industrial and business development. So I want to share with you some examples of um, how mass customization became uh, implemented in the kind of um, society at, at, at large. Um, the examples that I will show you are a little old, so you will see snapshots of websites as they existed roughly five years ago in 2016 before the symposium was convened. So what you're looking at is an example of um, customizable shoes. And uh, at this point, you know, like I ask people in the audience if you were now in front of me and I could see your faces, I would ask how many of you have used a website on the internet that would enable you to customize the product that you want. And typically the response that I would get, let's say in an auditorium that has 200 people, there might be you know, five to 10 people who would raise their hands. And I would give these lectures in the kind of schools of design, you know, where one would expect there will be many people who would have confidence to kind of design 
the things that they want to to have on the uh, using 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 interactive websites so this this kind of ability to customize products um, exists in quite a few domains it's not just shoes but clothes as well uh, appliances and as you will see cars and here is an example from you know Reebok uh, and a shoemaker where you know someone can can choose first the type of the shoe and then can start choosing fabrics and start could start choosing colors and can use can apply customized logos and, and so on so there were kind of many ways in one in which one can customize a shoe and these are some examples of the shoes designed by Reebok customers and notice the kind of the term that I'm using here these shoes were designed by the customers and some of these you may like and some of you know some of these are not so great depending on individuals taste and I will return to this topic to what is beautiful and what isn't uh, later later on but Reebok decided not to be the judge of what is beautiful or not they allowed their customers to, again to create the product that expresses who they are and that they find uh, beautiful that is the customers um, as i said this ability to customize things exists at a variety of scales so this is an example from the car industry where if somebody was interested in a mini cooper then you know there were all sorts of options that one can one can choose uh, starting with color the wheels and and so on you know a plethora of things that can be again customized to individuals taste and that scales up to um, to houses the kinds of things that we as as architects are involved involved in I mean my background is is in architecture and this is an example of a company called Toll Brothers uh, they uh, build uh, homes across the entire United States they have a website when work can, one can go to that website and can choose between 5,000 different types of houses where one can define how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, square footage, can specify the state, and et cetera. So the search can be narrowed. And this is an example, let's say, for someone who lives in the Northeast of the United States, they can ch choose one of these kind of brick uh, buildings. They can see the layout of the house and they're presented with some options you know they can add a bay a bay window uh, they can uh, add a fireplace and so on they can also choose some of the finishes and, and so on so some minor modifications are possible in, uh, in in this domain and they have bought the website they own the website design your own home dot dot com here is another company um, this one is was initially in Michigan, but then moved to California called Blue Homes, where they had something called the Blue Homes 3D Configurator, a kind of a similar model where one can choose between different types of houses. And, and again, you know, can go through a kind of series of, 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 of steps of designing, visualizing, and then getting a, a kind of a quote, how much the cow's house would cost and so on. Here is another company called Living Homes, where the owner of the company commissioned some prominent architects and uh, challenged them to uh, design a house that would have a broad appeal. And then in there, you know, there were, uh, the customers had the ability to co customize exterior, interior, bathrooms, etc. as you can actually see on this list and you can visit these websites to kind of see what they look like today and what are the kinds of options that are now accessible to the customers. Uh, for the people who are interested in, in, in purchasing a custom home that is kind of customized to, to their needs. Uh, this is an example from uh, New York, uh, a company called Resolution 4 Architecture, re4a.com. Um, that has a somewhat different approach to customization uh, based on modules. So the kind of modular design is something that is, is a kind of well-established paradigm in architecture. So they focused on designing the modules 
that can be then prefabricated, transported by truck to the building site, and where these modules can be combined in a number of different ways to create unique homes. And there is a kind of potential for these modules to be reconfigured, but based on my conversations with the owners of this, of, of this company, uh, not much reconfiguration was, uh, was, was happening. And there are certain rules as to how these modules can be connected to, to each other. So some of them are open on two sides, some of them open on one side, you know, where the exact location of the connection to the adjacent space can, uh, can, can, can vary. This is an example from um, Calgary, uh, where um, a, a colleague, former colleague of mine, John Brown, launched a company called House Brand. And their idea of customization is to provide homes that look exactly the same on the outside, but where the customization happens on the inside of the building. So there is what they call high performance shell. And then there is an interior that is tailored to the needs of the individual. And the, you know, the kind of key component of that kind of tailored um, uh, interior is what they call the modular storage that can be located in different points in the house and thus create different configurations. And what is beautiful about this design is it can change over time. So in other words, the location of, of some of these components can change as the needs of the family uh, uh, who lives in that home changes over time. You know, be mindful of the context that I'm describing. Again, this is the, co the context of the kind of United States and the kind of individual suburban home is what, is what many people aspire to in their, in their lives. Now, what is common to all of the examples that I showed you so far is that what can be customized is colors, materials, or finishes. There is no, in most cases, no or very limited customization of geometry. And that's a kind of interesting question. Why we cannot manipulate geometry? Why that option of manipulating geometry is not accessible? to the customers at large. That was the question that we wanted to answer at the symposium. And one can make an argument that the kind of condition that we have today has not really changed much since the kind of emergence of so-called catalog homes and the company called Sears became famous in the mid 20th century by publishing a catalog of homes that people can order and these homes you know, were delivered to the desired location and built by the builders who had a contract with, with Sears. So more or less the same metaphor, the same options existed. One can kind of choose the color of this, the, the, that kind of finish or that kind of material. But again, there was no manipulation of the geometry. So again, no customization of geometry. And the goal here, again, is to exploit the need to support greater product variety and individualization. And part of the answer probably lies in what people are comfortable customizing on their own. So most of us you know, will enjoy changing colors and finishes, but changing geometry is an entirely, entirely different, different thing. And I'll get, get to that. I'll get to that in a bit. Now, what we thought was mass customization in the cost context of architecture was actually something else. What we had over the past two decades is what uh, we refer to in our book as massive customization. So in other words, we focused on the production design that is geometric definition and production of a myriad of different components. So as some of you no, it is no longer necessary in the context of architecture and building industry for components to be the same. We no longer require repetition. So uniqueness is, is now possible, both in terms of design, production, and the economy of production. And this is an example that I've used in my lectures in the past. 
Uh, these are, this is a complex of office buildings uh, designed in Düsseldorf by Frank Gehry. Uh, these uh, office buildings had to compete for tenants in a kind of commercial office market. So in other words, these buildings could not be too expensive by definition. And as you know about Frank Gehry's work, uh, many of his buildings uh, feature rather unusual geometry uh, and not your typical geometry. And in this case, these white towers that you see were slightly twisted. And because of that slight twist, the steel components that support this external wall all had to be dimensionally unique. There were not two of them that were identical. But that was not a problem in the fabrication because the sheet metal company that had to produce these components didn't really care whether the steel supports were identical or not because the machine would spend the same amount of time cutting these steel components. What you're looking at is the so-called plasma arc cutter that is you know, cutting steel that you know, is uh, about half inch thick. Uh, and, and again, the only premium cost-wise was in the operator having to kind of look at the file. And I think the fabricator, if I remember correctly, charged like 15% more on this project than they would charge on any other, other project. So we ended up with this notion of massive customization where we can now produce different components in series directly from the kind of geometric models that we see on screen. Jose and I didn't come up with this term. It was actually a colleague of ours, uh, Mark Forness, who was also a speaker at the symposium. He created a firm here in New York called The Very Many. And I think, you know, his, what his firm did, they did a number of installations, whether art installations, interiors, outdoor pieces, that often consisted of a number of highly differentiated components that were that put together. There were very many of them, so hence the name of the of the company. And this is an installation that um, that he and our students did in Calgary. We invited him to work with with our students. So this is what this installation looked on the screen. Uh, again, it was to be these pieces were to be produced directly from the geometric model, and then. Uh, cut by fabrication equipment and then assembled in the gallery of our school. And here are some of the other structures that Mark Forness has designed. Again, these were done with very limited budgets, but they clearly demonstrate this kind of ability that we acquired in the 21st century to highly differentiate when it comes to components in, in, in the built, uh, built environment. Again, some more examples of Mark's work, and he has done dozens and dozens of, of, of these objects and interiors uh, over the past decade and a half. I want to talk a little bit about mass customization. Um, it was uh, conceptualized, conceived uh, by Stanley Davis in 1987, uh, who authored a book called The Future Shock. And in it, he defined it as uh, a business strategy in which the same large number of customers can be reached as in mass markets of the industrial economy and simultaneously be treated individually as in the customized markets of pre-industrial economies. So he's kind of hankering back to the artisanal times uh, of the, of the you know, 17, 18 and 19th century before the kind of industrialization started to uh, result in, in mass produced uh, uh, objects and products. And then here's that more succinct definition of uh, mass customization that Joseph Pine you know, came up in the eponymous book that was published in 1993. So uh, this is again, the, the kind of the, 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 the short history of mass customization, how that concept evolved again from mass production, from plus customization, giving us mass customization. Uh, and what it meant is that we went from a standardized product to configurable modular product, would be, which became a norm uh, for much of the kind of 1990s, even 1980s, and still exists as a kind of paradigm today. 
And the kind of next step, the one that Jose and I were dreaming about 20 years ago, what was is this kind of parametrized dimensionally variable product. So what I want to focus on in the next part of my talk is this kind of difference between surface and dimensional customization, because there are significant differences between, between the two. So this is what dimensional customization is about. And I'm going to unpack this a little bit in the kind of remaining part of my, my talk. It involves something that I've referred to as meta design. So it involves designing the design process. In other words, there has to be parametric definition of the geometry. The designer of the system defines some kind of parametric design space uh, in which an infinite number of variations can be produced. And then it, was the, it is the customer who then defines the specific geometry of the product, a particular instance, which is then digitally fabricated and shipped to the customer. So this is the kind of the principal set of ideas behind dimensional customizations and customization. And this is again what Jose and I uh, thought about uh, more than 20, 20 years, years ago. Here is the pioneering work of uh, a Frenchman whose name is Bernard Cash, who in mid 1990s uh, created a website called, website called objectile.com. And through that website, he uh, made this, this kind of wood panels um, accessible, this beautiful wood paneling accessible to, to, to a very broad range of people. And this is what that website looked like in a circa 1997, so almost 25 years ago. It was very rudimentary, as you can see here. This, is, this was state of the art of HTML, uh, the language that is used to program the, the websites. Uh, and then through JavaScript, you know, he created a kind of very simple interface with some slider bars. So where one can move the slider bar and set parameter values that would then produce different designs on the screen. So the idea is that almost anyone can manipulate those slider bars for a very simple intuitive interface, see instantly, visualize what that, what that change in parameter values produces. And if the customer kind of likes what is being produced, that can be digitally fabricated by the CNC machine and shipped to, to anyone. Back in the day, the server was in France, the interface was in English, the manufacturer was in New Zealand. Uh, and then the idea was that these panels can then be shipped by boat to whatever location around, around the world. Now, there is an interesting story about this website that I want to share with you. So if you go to, um, yeah, I'll actually, when I was showing this to my students in, uh, in early 2000s, uh, I kind of encourage them, I give a lecture like this, and I suggested them to visit the website and manipulate the slide of bars. The next time, you know, they came back, they were all giggling. And I was trying to understand what was so funny because I didn't think that the parametric design would be so amusing. And they tell me that, they told me that I sent them to a pornographic website. So what happened is that Bernard Cash didn't pay the domain registration fee for objectile.com and some pornographer purchased that website. And I've sent my students, you know, inadvertently to a pornographic website. It is safe to visit now, so, but it doesn't contain this, this kind of simple interface that I wanted to share with you now. And, and I think this kind of loss of this kind of historic artifacts, these websites that existed in the past, I think is something for contemporary historians to figure out because we really need to have these artifacts of design preserved. So for future kind of historical studies, you know, somebody 50 years from now will be interested in how these kind of notions of universally accessible design uh, uh, became, became possible. So here are some of the things that Bernard Cash did with his object tiles. Of course, this notion of meta design. So he created a, a kind of design process. There was parametric definition of the geometry and all the things that I, 
that I mentioned initially, all of them were present 24 years ago. So 24 years ago, this was again pioneered as a, as a possibility. Bernard designed all sorts of objects, so tables. So here are some of the tables with interesting shapes. They were very simply produced, you know, from you take um, um, ply, ply board simply, you paint it on the top, and then you use the milling machine to carve the shape and to kind of carve an interesting topography in it. And because of the fact that it's a kind of layered wood product, you produce something that looks very intricate visually and produces interesting patterns. He was commissioned by the French railways to create custom desks uh, for custom counters uh, for the various railway stations in France that kind of varied immensely in terms of the window and the interior and so on. And they were also meant to act as acoustic boxes as the two sides were talking to each other, like a perfect solution for the COVID age in which we live, uh, live, live now, without any need, you know, for microphones and speakers, and so on. And he wrote a book. Uh, he is not just a designer; he was also an economist, also trained as a philosopher. So he wrote a book in 1995 called "Earth Moves," and in that book, he made an argument that objects are no longer designed but calculated. And I just shared an example or some examples with you of the kinds of things that he did to kind of exhibit what that world of computational design uh, could, could look like. Greg Lynn, uh, a well-known American designer, in 2001 kind of created a, pro a provocative design for a house that he referred to as the embryological house. And it doesn't look like you know, your typical suburban house in, in, in North America as an interesting geometry. But then all of these houses were to be uh, topologically the same, meaning that they were meant to consist of the same number of components, exactly 2,048 panels, all of which could be kind of dimensionally unique. So one can create truly customizable kind of houses by visiting this, this website. It didn't have windows in the kind of conventional sense. So there were kind of a number of innovative things that he introduced at that time. And he was also trying to be kind of forward looking where one can kind of choose flexible photovoltaics for the kind of exterior of the building, can also customize other options on the house. And then the idea in the end is that once the geometry is defined, that all bits of the house could be fabricated, created, and then shipped to the, to the site where they could be erected. It was not a fully functional website, but it was a sketch of the kinds of things that await us in the future. And again, this was envisioned 20, 20 years ago. Same principles as I have you know, explained uh, previously, the kind of same notions of how one would go about customizing the home. I want to talk a little bit about um, meta design. Um, uh, there is you know, meta knowledge, there is meta did, this and meta that. So in, it, it simply means in case of knowledge, it's like knowledge about knowledge. So meta design is design about design. It's designing the design. It's designing the system that can produce a range of design options. In, the, in essence, the designer would create a design space that can be populated with thousands, millions, or an infinite number of different, different designs. In order for this kind of world of meta design to become accessible to wider masses, one needs to work uh, with a certain parametric minimalism. In other words, you cannot create a product, even if it's a house, that would involve hundreds of parameters. And if you can think of the house, there are so many things that can be customized. So what one can do is to actually create hierarchies of parameters so that you first define, let's say, how many rooms there should be in the house. Then you can define the kind of overall dimensions of the house. Then you can then go in and define dimensions of the room, particular room, 
And then in a particular room, you can then define the size of the window and so on. And there would have to be a simple and engaging interface. So a designer of this kind of meta design process would have to think about geometry in very deliberate terms and think about them in the following way. What is the minimum number of parameters that is needed to customize the geometry, let's say, of a house or a product? Should there be a hierarchical relationship between them? And what would make interfacing with the geometry of the product interesting for the customer? And I showed you example of, of Bernard's work where for one set of panels, there was only a single parameter, essentially a random number that would kind of create the, the wavy pattern. And then for another panel that was a bit more complicated, there were about four different parameters. And I'll give you a good analogy, like what this means. It used to be that at some point in the past, you know, we had computer monitors that had all sorts of knobs that people could manipulate because the assumption was that people would want to produce the best possible picture they want with the best color fidelity that they would want and so on. And somehow in the end, we ended up only with contrast and brightness. So those were the two parameters that people could work with because if you go beyond two parameters, let's say give you five options to people to adjust, they will get lost. Like they would never get to a kind of good picture. But if you give them two parameters, almost everybody should be able to produce a kind of good picture on, uh, on the screen. And if you think of the cell phones that we have today, the only parameter that can be varied is brightness. So we're down to a single parameter to what we're at one time, like eight different things that could be adjusted on, on the screen. Um, here is another example that is worth talking about, uh, done um, by two colleagues from Switzerland who also teach at the Swiss Institute of Technology, also run their own firm, Fabio Gramazio and Matthias Koller. In 2005, they created what they call M-Table. That's a kind of dining table that has holes in it. It's a kind of really interesting table, like where you have to be very conscious of the table's topography so that you don't put the plate, you know, that hot soup in the wrong place, and then all sorts of disasters could, could, could happen. Uh, at that time, and this was before iPhone, so this is 2005, the Nokia came up with a revolutionary phone at that time, you know, that enabled people to design apps, and they took advantage of that and created a very simple interface for the people who wanted to design, you know, their own M table, the dining table that I just showed you. Only three, uh, three parameters in terms of overall dimensions, uh, the, the length, the width, and the height, and then customers could manipulate the locations of little dots on the, on the screen on the right and essentially create the undulating topography of the underside of the table. And then what the customer would do is send a text message that would essentially go to the website containing the parametric values, like the location of this kind of pressure points that would create the underlying topography, the overall geometry, and then the customers on that website could visualize what their table looks like. They could choose the finish for the table, like if they want natural wood, what kind of wood, they can choose color and so on. Once they like what they see, then the CNC machine would then produce the table, which can be then sent to the, to the customer. And in their work, um, after they, they kind of published uh, this 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 project all sorts of interesting questions were pro provoked by by their work which is how do we as designers of these meta design systems control what our customers produce because obviously as designers we're interested in beauty we're interested in aesthetics uh, and so we cannot just according to some we cannot just shrug our shoulders and you know simply say well it's up to the customers the beauty is in the eye of the of the of the beholder. And in the case of Matthias and Fabio, they simply said, whatever customer considers beautiful, that's fine with us. We are not going to impose our own aesthetic on them. But if you think about it, they actually already imposed a certain aesthetic on the customers 
like this table had to have holes. So that was kind of what defined that, that table. But this again raises this issue of what exactly designers of meta design systems should allow their customers to, to manipulate. There is this critical question of design tolerance. Like as an author of a meta design system, what are you willing to tolerate? You know, what constitutes good designs? And how do you cut out? How do you remove the possibility of so-called bad designs? And these are kind of non-trivial questions to, to answer. And when it comes to design control, there are obviously aesthetic considerations. There is performance verification. Can you imagine a customer, you know, who can make a table that is too big, you know, has too many holes, you know, like Swiss cheese and would not be structurally viable. So in other words, a table that can just collapse, like if somebody sits on it or can put something on, on top of it. So one would have to kind of ensure in the case of that table that it's kind of structurally viable, that it won't fall apart if there is a, a load on it. There is also, also production viability. So in other words, whatever gets designed through meta design systems had to be viable in terms of fabrication and assembly. So in Jose, in my view, Jose's in my view, these are again the kind of key, uh, key considerations that again, we should exercise as designers of meta design systems. I wanna end my lecture by talking about um, houses because this is the kind of bread and butter of what um, architects do. Um, this is obviously, this is a reality in kind of many North American cities. Um, ugly houses that are large, produced in large quantities. Uh, and that's what American public buys. And you will notice that these houses kind of do look somewhat different. You will notice that roof shingles have a different color and some of them have different uh, colors on the front. Uh, you will notice that some of them are for a single, actually, I think they're all for two cars, two car garages, but you also notice that they differ in size. You know, there are some of the kind of smaller houses, there are some of the larger houses and so on. And this is what is again offered on the market. And some in our community would think, oh, this is perfect for mass customization because then every single one of these families should be actually able to create a highly customizable home because it's not just about you know changing the color or changing some of the materials we can do a lot more than that the question is like is the market is the society at large ready for a mass customized home because it is possible in terms of technology we can create parametrically defined geometry. We can create interactive websites to kind of define the geometry. And we can have these kind of uniquely shaped components that will come out of this customization process. We can have them digitally prefabricated. So it is technologically possible. It is economically attainable because we have CNC machines that can be programmed to kind of cut almost at any, any size. And we can have robots that can kind of very quickly nail these things together or where the labor is inexpensive. You know, this, these components can be also put together relatively inexpensively. But the real question is how many people out there uh, are prepared to design their own home? Because if you think about it, like if you ask your aunt or you know, your mother or father who are not designers, if you were to turn to them or your siblings who are not designers and you say, you know, would you have confidence to design, you know, your own home? They would say, well, I don't know, or a car or a shelving system. They would turn to you as a designer and they would ask you for an opinion. Like uh, they would say, um, Louisa, tell me what you think. You know, is this a good looking house or is this a good looking, looking table? And this actually points to what is a fundamental problem, is that the population at large 
are not designers. They do not have confidence to be designers. They don't believe that what they design is looking good or would actually work as, as advertised and so on. So we would need to reach a certain degree of design literacy in the population at large before mass customization becomes geometric customization, becomes a kind of viable design and production capability. It would involve things that I mentioned. And this is, let's say, at some point in the future, as you know, apps become available as they exist now, you, know, you can customize geometrically uh, shelving systems. There are actually quite a few apps that allow you to, to do this, like when you, in the world of furniture, but nothing yet in the world of homes. But at some point, somebody's going to come up with a system that will enable people to customize homes. And what I'm proposing is that meta designing a home will involve the following things an architect who acts as a meta designer of the entire system, customer who then becomes a designer of the product, where the role of the architect, not just the one who designed the, the overall system, but there would be architects who would then work alongside customers and help them customize the home, give them confidence that what they're designing would work. So what we would end up with is this kind of notion of co-designing where the customer and the architect work together, which is a reality for a very small percentage of the population today. But good design in this fashion could become accessible to more than a kind of tiny percentage of the population. Where our hope is that design, the service that we provide to the to the society at large will become more socially and culturally relevant because we we as designers and, and architects occupy a rather niche segment of of what gets built and what gets produced out there whether the context is the us brazil finland or nigeria my hope in the end is that we would achieve what i would refer to as design democracy like where good design won't be just a domain of the few but that good design would be accessible to masses so that's the kind of second part of the title of the book this is the kind of the front and the back of the of the book and it's the kind of the last slide of my presentation the names of the people whom i mentioned during my presentation there were the speakers um, at the symposium. I didn't cover all of them. There is a lot more that can be said on this topic. But um, at this point, you know, I would invite you to, to ask any questions that you may have about the lecture that I've uh, delivered so far, about the topics that I've covered so far. And I think we have about 12 minutes left. I think that's what I promised. To, to Louisa when she invited me to give this, this talk. So I wanna thank you for your attention. I think I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. And I was alerted by Louisa that the questions will be posed in chat. So I see that there are some comments in uh, Portuguese. So uh, Louisa, I don't know if there are some questions already for me to answer. Thank you, Branco, for that great lecture. Um, I'm not, I have to take a look at the chat, but maybe I'll start with the question. <laughs> um, how do you see this um, transforming uh, architectural education, if you see it? What impact do you see um, in this sense for architectural education? So um, I think we, we have to introduce this as a possibility. Uh, you know, for the future generations of designers and architects. You know, our obligation as educators is to prepare uh, future architects not only for what is happening today, what exists as a kind of reality today, but to kind of imagine some future context in which they will operate. And what I've sketched out tonight may become, and I'm saying may become, the kind of reality of architectural practice 
in the future. This could become mainstream or it could be confined to the kind of niche applications as it is today. But there could be some amazing designer in Pelotas or in Newark, you know, where I am, who could kind of come up with um, an, an amazing engaging system and turn this into, into you know, commercial reality, something that pe people would have access to and would enjoy doing, you know, whether it's the interior of the home or a shelf or an entire house, as I kind of sketched out in my presentation. So it should be presented as a possibility. And and do you think it would am I do you think it would um, change the kind of um, courses that architects take? Um, not necessarily. Again, in the short term, um, I, you know, I would cover this in courses that um, deal with the kind of technologies of design that we are using today. So parametric design is now accessible to everyone using Revit. Revit is actually a parametric uh, environment. And you know, there was a colleague uh, that actually created a, a parametric system for designing houses uh, using, uh, using Revit. So, so these technologies are now common in the discipline. Uh, the students are being introduced to parametric design but in a parametric design, not in a sense of making it publicly accessible, but simply being accessible to design teams, you know, who are designing buildings, designing building components, and so on. So it's, it's still internal to the discipline, both parametric design and digital fabrication, and they're almost universally introduced nowadays, but that has not been pushed externally into the society at large. So our students are learning about this, but our society is not learning about this, which is what I was advocating for in my lecture, that we need a kind of a degree of design literacy in the kind of population uh, at large. And that will slowly evolve over the years, as I'm sure you know, apps will begin to emerge where this will become a, a kind of, first of all, a very niche uh, kind of used by a few people and the kind of number of people who will be using these apps is likely to go, grow over time, so perhaps over the next two or three decades. So perhaps by 2050, like, you know, we may have, this may define the kind of world of design uh, as was imagined like you know, back at the end of the 20th century. Uh, do you think this kind of uh, app, like you were talking about, they could uh, be helpful in educating the, uh, Maybe the population maybe I, but i have yet you know i have yet to see something out there that that i would you know say oh wow amazing so it's like you know it's the 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 facebook or the whatsapp you know that that uh, kind of changed how we uh, interact with each other how we communicate with each other with each other we need something similar to kind of revolutionize how design is is how products are being consumed because the current paradigm is that you, you know, either go into a store or you go online, you see what is available, you pick what is available, and then, you know, that's how design is, is consumed. And there are people who design shoes, who design clothes, you know, who define what is fashionable nowadays. And then the ambition here is that each of us could be the creators of our own fashion, so to speak, whether that is you know, clothes or cars or houses. And one can say, well, you know, fashion is superficial, but if you think of the kind of, you know, history of, of, of you know, humanity, um, there were people who, you know, were interested in expressing themselves uh, through how they dress, where they live, or today, like, you know, to what they drive and, 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 and so on. So um, again, I'm not a futurist, uh, I don't have a crystal ball you know, next to me. Um, I've shared with you tonight, you know, what, what preoccupied me, what I've imagined as a future 20 years ago. And I thought that this kind of world of mass customization is just around the corner, like in five to 10 years, this is gonna be a reality for everyone. Well, 20 years later, it's not a reality for anyone, so to speak. So it's like, I have been wrong in the past and I could be very wrong today. So I'm simply sharing with you my thinking some time ago and my current thinking related to to the kind of future of design as I see it today. Um, so one of the questions coming in from the chat, 
uh, in your view, um, in which stages of uh, the process of mass customization of houses or homes um, is the direct intervention of users possible? Well, I've, I've sketched that in my in my lecture. It's it's surface customization. I call it surface material uh, customization. In other words, you're not changing the geometry. This is super easy. So it's like you can choose the color. You can choose a kind of different material, whether that's shoes, cars, or houses. The paradigm is the same. So no change in geometry. It's what I would call superficial customization. The really hard customization to, to do is the change in, in geometry because it implies all sorts of things. It becomes super complicated very fast. But as, as, as Bernard Cash showed, it can be super simple with a very simple interface. Like the reason I sh shared with you M table, because I thought that was beautiful, like so minimalistic and the kind of interface with the customer and the entire process 16 years ago, like, you know, super simple. So my question is why there aren't more M tables out there, like the apps that can enable us to create interesting stuff. I can see this question from Carlos, Carlos Price. Okay. Um, in the smart citizen spirit, you believe that the building skins can be an urban agent capable of helping cities go beyond mass consumption age. I don't know. I can't really you know, answer that, that question. There is a, a movement called open building. Uh, and in open building, uh, there is a difference between uh, what the, uh, the people who conceptualize that, that idea distinguish between the, the shell and the infill. The shell being just the structure of the building. It's 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 uh, structural support, and they're saying all that needs to be erected is the structure of the building, and then each person who is buying a volume of space, each person should be able to customize what that space would look like inside and also on the facade. So if you Google open building, like you will come across some kind of interesting examples of what that entails in in uh, in in. In, in, in practice, so that does exist as a, as a, as a, as a paradigm. There's a question from Larissa Miranda. Um, what do I suggest for those micro and small offices that want to work with performative architecture? Oh, think about your local context and think about, you know, how you could innovate in your local context. Think about what some of the builders you know, can manufacture locally, and then think about how you could make that accessible to them. And I'll actually mention Louisa's own work, you know, her PhD that I had a pleasure to, to supervise. She was focused on social housing in Brazil that is very quickly modified by the people who live in those houses. And she was interested in enabling people to, to and not just people, authorities, to have some agency in how that modification of social housing happens so that it's affordable for the families, that is that it meets the kind of code that exists in, in, in certain municipalities in Brazil, in cities in Brazil, so that these modifications are not illegal as is presently, presently the case. So I don't know how far Luisa has got with that with that process, but she and her PhD defined the entire ecology of the system, how that would have to work from somebody who gets a house in social housing in Brazil to somebody who issues building permits in a particular city to someone who has to build these houses to a building supplier who can then supply the materials for the families at some say subsidized prices so that they could modify these houses and so on so there is extensive room for innovation in all sorts of realms of of building from social housing to luxury housing and again shows you the kind of upper end of that in my in, in my lecture but it's also possible again at in, 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 in social housing, as Louisa's work has demonstrated uh, through her PhD. I remember um, going to the symposium that you mentioned. I was just starting out 
and everything seemed amazing. And then it turned out the complexity of um, how you apply all that turned out to be yeah. a lot more. <laughs> So, so if I could share Louisa with the group, you know, Louisa was initially interested in creating this amazing interactive application, but then she quickly realized that that what is really needed for that application to be effective, there has to be a proper social and cultural context, an economic context, like in case of social housing in in in, in Brazil. So her focus shifted very quickly from a technology that is an interactive app to systemic relationships that would actually make an app that she wanted to design possible. See, in other words, for that app to work, something else had to exist in the industry, in the society at, at large. This is what I'm referring to the kind of ecology. Like think of how Apple designed its iPhone, like iPhone without the apps, without everything else that exists in that ecosystem would be meaningless. So one has to again conceptualize that entire system you know from design through production to marketing to maintenance to i mean it's a, it's a kind of the entire context has to be imagined before it's it's realized simple things furniture are possible but houses a bit more complicated because there is this thing called building permits so and until that becomes kind of automated to some extent, uh, I think we're going to run into major, major hurdles. There is another lecture from Raquel uh, Leite. Um, her question is about the adaptability, adaptability of mass customized designs. Which strategies can we employ in early design stages to make customization possible over time? Read Louisa's PhD. That's kind of the answer that I, that I, that I have because she has covered that extensively. In, in the kind of context of Brazil in, uh, in particular. And she's also referencing some examples around the, around the world. So I don't know, Louisa, if your PhD is accessible to the, to the people who are you know, uh, listening to this lecture tonight. Yes, yes, it is. It's accessible online. Yes. So, so Louisa covers, you know, ad adaptability is possible. And I cited one example in my lecture, my colleague, uh, former colleague, you know, from, from Calgary, who precisely focused on the adaptability of the homes inside, how interiors could be easily reconfigured without having to demolish you know, half of the house. You can simply move components to different, different, different locations. And solutions like this exist in the world of commercial interiors. There are large companies, at least in the US, that uh, provide this kind of highly customizable, adaptive, interiors for for office spaces they were interested in the housing market you know i spoke to to one of the companies this was more than a decade ago but they haven't ventured into that that yet they thought that the technology that they have for the commercial office space that the same technology can be applied to domestic space so i, I think there are companies out there that are interested in this uh, notion of adaptive homes homes that adapt over time to the needs of the occupants. Felipe, um, integrating performance modeling with artificial intelligence could eventually fill the gap of customers' lack of design knowledge and deliver good options according to their needs. Yes, I think that is a that is a possibility. And then, but what I do know is that um, AI algorithms uh, re require good data samples, so you need to feed them hundreds, thousands of good designs for these apps to kind of learn what a good design is and work with, with customers. So you can imagine an app that, that, that says, uh-uh, ain't gonna work. So things, of, the, things of, the, of that sort, like, you know, based on a limited number of examples that they can, they can work with. So yes, I think there is uh, room for innovation uh, that combines uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms uh, with performative design, as you alluded in your in your in your question, that was a very good question, as were the previous ones. Um, I'm sorry, I was <laughs> I was reading the question in the sense of design democratization. Mm -hmm. 
mass customization, is it possible only as parametric rules? Oh, sorry, it's not the same one. <laughs> No, but it's, it's it's a good question. So so so, so I, I gave you the example of of again surface customization. There are other customizations that are kind of referred to in the in the book. I mentioned the the, the modular design, and that was used by um, this architectural firm from New York, uh, Resolution for Architecture. I, again, you know, there is a potential for their houses to be reconfigured. And the initial configuration of the house is again based on, 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 on modules. So that's that's what the that's modular customization. That's different from parametric customization because in modular customization there are defined rules how the modules can be attached together, like two or three sides on top and and, and so on. So it does that doesn't involve parametric design, but does involve certain rules. So that involves rules uh, rules based design. I hope that I've answered the, 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 the question. Uh, Pedro has the following question. Can the rapid advancement of digital design processes somehow hinder the transition from traditional processes in regions and cultures that are used to intuitive uh, processes? It's a good question. Um, there is uh, <clears throat> much uh, embedded knowledge in how buildings are built. And it's the case all over the world that essentially most of the houses are built by non-designers. So in many cultures, the owners simply would find a local contractor or they themselves will build their homes. And there are some beautiful examples that we admire. So if one can say, think of uh, Greek villages, you know, that were not built by, by, I'm talking about these white villages that you see in the postcards, you know, from Greece. Or I would even say some favelas that I had a chance to, to visit in, in, in Brazil have a certain kind of homogeneity and character um, that I, for example, found to be quite, quite compelling. There is a certain set of inherent rules in how these houses get, get built. So I'm, I was just trying to imagine, you know, if, 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 there are, if these rules some, can be somehow codified so that, that this kind of local practices that define a particular region or a community can find their kind of full, full, full expression. Um, I hope that I'm doing justice to the questions that are being asked. So here's Alfonso's question, and I, I can probably take one more question, and then we'll have to, to cut this off because I have to, I have to leave. So Alfonso's question is, if you want to change layouts, concrete or bricks are not the best materials, right? Maybe wood or light materials better. It's a good, very good question, because it's not just a question of you know what would impact the uh, configuration of spaces, but it's also a question of what is good for the environment. Because if you if you, there are some of you who follow green design, I'm assuming, and there is much discussion about something called life cycle assessment, or environmental life cycle assessment in design. And the distinctions between uh, energy performance of buildings uh, and embodied energy and energy needed for the operation of the home. So buildings that are houses that are made, you know, from concrete or brick have high embodied energy. Houses that are made from wood have relatively low embodied energy. So the fact that we would build from wood but not only facilitate reconfiguration of the, of the homes, but such houses would be also better for the environment. And it's really unfortunate that concrete is now a ubiquitous uh, material all over the world because it's relatively cheap, so to speak, but its environmental cost is relatively high because cement is one of the most energy intensive materials to produce. If you think about mining, what it takes to kind of end up with cement uh, on the, on the construction, construction site. And then you have to think about what happens to the material once, let's say that house needs to be demolished. So what I'm trying to say, there is a, another conversation that we haven't really touched upon tonight, like what is good for the future of the environment. And I would like to think 
that homes that can be customized and adapted over time would have a longer life than a home that is difficult to, to, to modify. So maybe one more question, and then Louisa, I'm sorry, we would have to bring I, this. Yeah, I know. I think you, you mentioned, and so people stopped uh, posting questions in the chat, so that was just in time. Thank you very much, Branko, for, for um, the lecture and taking all our questions. Um, Patrice is going to end the stream, but we can stay on in the background if you can, just two minutes. I can stay a bit in, in, in the background. So uh, uh, I want to thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the invitation to speak. And again, I want to thank all of you who attended the lecture. So um, I hope that I have inspired you to try certain things. And I kind of look forward to seeing this kind of killer apps that some of you, you know, may create in the, in, in, in the future. Thank you.